everybody and welcome back to the test screening. My name is Chloe and there is no Billy with me this week but instead we have an extra special guest. He is a BAFTA nominated writer, director and producer for his short film The Ballad of Olive Morris and his name is Alex Kayod K. Alex had a great conversation. He was really forthcoming with all of the information about making his short, about his journey as a filmmaker, and about some of the films that influenced him on his journey. So it's been a pleasure to chat with him, and I'm really looking forward to you guys hearing the conversation. So without further ado, here is my interview with Alex Kayod K. Hi Alex, first of all, how's it going? It feels like forever since we since we last spoke. Oh, it's going good. I'm just been, you know, yeah. Was, I think it was in at Bolton Film Festival. Yeah, it was. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where we first met. Yeah, so I, uh, you know, I was, I was done um, my film and, and yeah, you, you know, you gave it a very good review. So thank you. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. I mean, since since we last spoke, it feels like you've been everywhere with this film. I mean, just to, just to list off a few, recently been selected for Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival in Massachusetts. It's been screened in Colombia. It's been screened in LA. It's been screened in Berlin. Not to mention festivals all across the UK, York, Cambridge. And I'm going to stop listing them because we'd be here a while. So, I mean, how does it feel to have your work recognised in that way? That must feel amazing. Yeah, um, it's you know, it's surreal. You know, like um, you know, when you when you make when you make a film, you kind of like you don't you you don't necessarily know. You know, you're all for the best, but you just don't know how it's how it's going to be received. I mean, I've made you know, I've made things that I thought were going to you know, you know, you be big successes, and it just kind of came and went. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. One, I'm grateful um, that it's been received so well. Um, it's got the accolades it's had, and you know that people like it. So I'm just really thankful, and because um, you never know it's going to happen again. So you just got, you just got, just got to enjoy it while it lasts. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, the film is called The Ballad of Olive Morris. So could you tell us a bit about what what is the film about? Who was Olive Morris? Okay, um, the film. Film is about um, the titular character um, Olive Morris. She's actually um, a real life person. Um, she was active in uh, the nineteen sixties and seventies, uh, primarily in Brixton, but parts of her life in Manchester as well. Um, she was a she was a young um, Afro Caribbean um, um, who came over uh, as part of the Women's Generation, and in her early in a in a sort of like mid to late teens, she you know, remember the uh, British Black band the Party. Um, kind of like became just a, just an activist, you know, fighting for the civil rights, um, for black people, both women as well, and against kind of like injustices that you know were very prevalent at the time, like police brutality. So um, she was a very very brave uh, and powerful um, individual. This um, story isn't really as well known as it should be, so. That was my impetus to make this film. So when I found out about her, when I lived in Brixton for a period of time, wow. and then I found out who she was, and then I decided, okay, um, no one's actually made any sort of film about her. Of, of, wow. Of this type, not even a documentary. So I just figured, okay, yeah, if um, I'm a filmmaker, this is what, I, this is what I'm paying off student else to do. So, you know, I get the opportunity to do it. That's what I um, kind of set about doing. So, yeah, that's that's uh, the intro. So that's who Olive Morris was. But she was amazing. She was a really amazing character. I mean, like the the um, essential. I I I couldn't. T- I made a short film, so I couldn't. I couldn't retell her life. One, it was just impossible to fit that all into um, the time I had to tell the story. But I took a took a moment in time when she was seventeen years old, and she kind of. Directly interceded in a, in in, a, in an event where the police were falsely arresting a Nigerian diplomat, and you know they accused him of stealing his own car. You know he was getting beaten and arrested, and she stepped in. She was seven years old, a kid, whole crowd disturbance, but she he was the one that she came, jumped in, and you know physically put herself in harm's way uh, against the police. She got beaten up for her troubles and arrested, taken out to the station. It was this, um, yeah, um, it's a it, that that that. Incident in itself is a, is a microcosm of like her life. One amazing. I think she should be really a household name. 
A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, the courage that she displayed at just 17 years old, that that's incredible that, that you know, to kind of rush out. I mean, there's the scene, the kind of inciting scene in the film where she kind of rushes head first into, in, into the conflict. I mean, you know, there were people just kind of standing by, you know, sympathetic to what was going on, but she just went straight in. I mean, that that's a real like strength of character. Yeah, and and the funny thing is that she she never stopped doing that, even though that like, even though for her troubles, she 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 got beaten up and she got very sexual assault in the, in the police station. Um, but it didn't deter her. Like she still went out after that and became actually became even more sort of confrontational against these type of injustices. And yeah, um, like I said, these are the type of these are the type of people that generally um they get celebrated, they become icons. Um. Almost is an icon, but I think right now she's an icon in lowercase, I should capital letter icon. So that's what um I hope um my sh- will ha- will cut ha- like you know, just inform more people about who she is and get to that place in British history where she deserves to be. I mean, because she's not, like you say, like she she hasn't really been um awarded that icon status as yet. She we need more awareness of her. But how did you come across her as as a historical figure, how did how did you discover her story? Because um, she's not a character you can kind of just stumble across, which is frustrating. Yeah, she's kind of like she's she's more of a low. She, like I said, I I happened upon her because I because I've not grown up I've grown up in this country, but I haven't been taught her in school or or anything like that. But uh, again, like I when I lived in I I moved to Brixton around two thousand and sixteen, um, and she was she. That was where she primarily operate, uh, operated out. Um, that was where she lived, and and and, and so forth. So uh, she actually had a building named after her called Olive Morris House, um, which is a council, which was a local council. It's it's, it's since been demolished um, during the lockdown, um, but it was named after after she died. And basically, it's a it's a place for um, local uh, people within the local area within. Uh, uh, we have housing issues, um, any sort of housing issues to go and get resolved. Um, and that's, and the reason that it was named after her is because obviously she, she had notoriety within Brixton, but she also fought for housing rights and squatters rights amongst all the other, um, sort of activism that she did. So, um, when I went, I had, I had, I had a specific issue with my landlady at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, long story, but um, I was having issues. I was having my own housing issues. So someone would recommend that I go down to Olive Morris' house, get it, get it looked at, get it sort of mediated. Did uh, when I went there, um, I saw a picture of Olive Morris on the wall. There was a megaphone, and it was like I was quite intrigued. I was like, "Who is this person? Why is this building named after him?" So that's kind of that got me down the rabbit hole of finding out more about her. When I left, uh, I did the whole you know internet Google search thing and found out. A fair amount of information, you know, you know, you put you type in all the voice into into your search engine, you'll find a lot, you know, but it's it's all like a lot of it comes from um sort of uh archive repositories from an organization called Remember All the Moist Collective, um, which is co founded by um one of uh, one of her best friends, um Liz Obi. And it's basically um it's an archive it's, it's in the Lambeth archives. It's uh uh it's uh, it's a project that's situated in the Minette Library. And basically, it's got interviews with people who knew her, um, sort of newspaper clippings, and any information, sort of just 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 information about Olive Morris in an archive um, designed to actually keep her memory alive. But that's really about it. When I looked further into it, I thought, oh, this is you know, I started reading more about her, what she did, and you know, the incident with the police, uh, with the police and in the Nigerian like, diplomat. I was like, wow, this this, this kid's amazing. Um, but yeah, I was like, it's, this, this, this girl's amazing. And then I, I, it, there must be, you know, like films about her or you know, doc, doc, documentaries about her. I just kept on looking at her. Mm-hmm. Really, there's nothing. There's really no audio visual content about her, or, um, which is a, which I thought, yeah, and which I thought was a, was a big shame because that's really, I mean, where, where, where the film, uh, we know how powerful the media that is. That's what we um, gets people people's attention. You know, 
when you are when you are documented in that way. She's never had that. I think that's part of the issue. Um, because mm-hmm. story, her story is eminently sort of like cinematic or television or whatever whatever they have done yet. So yeah. Yeah, it kind of I mean film's so powerful in that way that it can kind of immortalize a character in in the public image. I mean, w- when we get onto some of your, you know, some of your influences a little bit later, talk about the film Malcolm X, and just to touch a bit on the kind of the, the style and the the gravitas that he brings, that, that Spike Lee brings to that film, and that character that before you would only see in like black and white in in images, it it really does immortalize them as a full person, as a character. Um, I mean, one of the just to kind of absolutely. Yeah, to carry, I mean, to carry on with that with that film, I mean, Malcolm X is such a warts and all portrayal, which is something that I really respected about it. So I, I want to kind of know when you were bringing this, when you were bringing this woman's story to life and kind of, I mean, it's so tricky to look at, like you said, you touched on this, to look at a life and put it into a 10 minute story. How did you decide on the moment to kind of put into that 10 minutes that would kind of... You know, how did you decide what part of her story to to tell? Because it's such a difficult thing to do. Yeah. Um. Again, I needed to. Again, because even even compared to uh, um, even compared to Malcolm X, Malcolm X was was still a much more celebrated figure even before he had film made about him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Much more white. Yeah, yeah. Um. Uh. Olive Morris. Olive Morris was very much a local kind of um figure. There's Peter. She's not. She, He's not like a completely unknown, but again, you just you kind of you probably have to be in Brixton and hear about her, hear stories about her to really, you know, stumble across her. Like I, yeah. Um. So I thought, yeah, I thought one of the things I thought, well, she should be much more well known than she is. But I kind of have to get across in a, a very succinct and very very quick manner. Uh, why she why she should be a big deal? Why she not? Why she's important to Mission Street? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's why I chose that 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 specific incident because it has a, it, yeah, um, yeah. That's why that's why I chose that specific incident because it kind of has it kind of has everything you need to recognize that this was a, a unique and very um special individual. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. The teenager, seventeen years old. So she was so young to be doing the things that that she did. Yeah. There was a I, looking on. I was looking on the website for the for the film and reading some of the. Uh, I think your DP did a really like nice breakdown on kind of the visuals for the for the film. And in his, in his kind of bit, he said that you didn't want to romanticize this part of Olive's life. And I just I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate on that because I found that a really interesting statement in like you know what why do you want this moment not to be kind of that idea of romanticizing these these moments in in film well you got, it has to be you, you kind of have to, it has to have an impact you know and if you start if, it, if you start doing if you start making it a bit to i guess um what's the word sanitize um it's gonna lose it's, it's gonna lose all it's gonna lose it's gonna lose all um um power i guess no I, I like I said, this is not. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't flatter a British society at the time. You know, it yeah. doesn't paint the police in a flattering light at all. You know, it really, it's really, it's very um, what's and all that. You no, know, it kind of shows that you can just be walking around your normal life, you know, doing nothing, and you know, the authorities can just do anything they feel like to you at that time because you're black. You know, and that's not really something we like. Americans are very upfront about confronting, you know, that element of their, their history. In the UK, it's, it's much less so. You know, like if you, you know, if you, if you, you look in British film or, or television, you know, the, you know, it's all about the boy on the beat and, you know, they're all, they're all lovely people and they're trying to help old ladies off <laughs> street, you know, across the street. And, you know, yeah, you know, to be, to be, to be a, to be a black person in, in South London or London at that time. Uh, that was not your experience with the, you know, and that had to be, you know, and that's why I said, you know, it could, I couldn't afford to romanticize that, you know, I had to be very, you know, really honest. And then, you know, and you know, I, you know, there's some, there's some people who read it and I'm like, God, they're big, they'll never be, 
do it. They'll never do that. Why would they put them to their jobs? Like, yeah, that's, you know, yeah, that's not very, that's not very realistic to the experiences that I've actually researched. What people like. And people actually were live at the time and they, they end up not watching from the live. Yeah, that's how it was. That's how it was. Yeah, I remember. But, um, there was a woman in the audience at Bolton, and I can't remember if she was old enough to yeah, Bolton, yeah. remember the time or whether she was kind of recounting she it. Was. She, oh, was. she was. She was. She was. Um, yeah, but she, she seemed to connect so much with she it. Was. I mean, have you have you had many other reactions like that? Pe- do people come up and tell you their their experiences and their stories from, from that time period? Yes, yes. I've, 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 I've screened it. I've screened, I've screened it from it. A- for a number of people of that generation, and yeah. and pretty much everyone, every almost all of them were like, "Yeah, this is this is this this how life was. That's what you know. That's how things were. You know, the not just not not just the actual uh, yeah, like the, that they the, someone someone actually recounted an incident to, an incident of their own where." Um, a member of their family was, you know, accosted by the police for no reason and, and all this type of thing. And it, it, to them, it just felt raw. It just felt like this, you know, that's a that's a 10 minute distillation of how they used to live, you know, yeah. just kind of in, in fear. Yeah. Yeah. It must be amazing. Yeah. And again, again, this is not. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, it's mad as well because I wasn't even alive. Well, <laughs> and this, you know, so for me, so, you know, um, yeah, when like that's 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 why I I, I had I felt a particular responsibility because this is not it's not a story from from my life from my lifetime you know but I have a responsibility as a filmmaker to try and tell it as faithfully as possible so um, it was important to actually talk to a lot of people who lived through that time period and um, try and get you know get the experiences people who knew all of itself um like a like a friend as be I eventually met members of a family. So yeah, um, it was, uh, it was really important to kind of like, you know, absorb that, um, to try and make it feel like a bit more lived in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, one of the things that really struck me about your film is that I can't remember seeing many films from this time period about this subject matter from a, a female perspective. Um, and you, you were just saying that you kind of, you know, spoke to family members, mm-hmm. like people who were, were there at the time, but. I mean, that's something that really kind of connected with me because during the time, you know, women were not treated well, uh, especially not black women. And it's just really great to kind of get their point of view because when you look at other stuff from that time, I mean, even stuff that about like the civil rights movement, usually American stuff, the women's stories usually are, you know, put to one side or, you know, it, it always makes like a little part of me sometimes dies when you, you see them mistreated so much and we don't kind of get a, a little look inside their mind. And there's this gorgeous, gorgeous scene in your film where you have this interaction with a with a female police officer. It's a really complicated kind of little bit of dialogue between them. And I, I was just wondering, was that from account or was that something that you consciously wanted to put into the film because it, it's such like a it's such a great little kind of condensed moment about like this kind of connection between them they kind of recognize each other's struggles but they don't fully understand each other yeah yeah that was kind of like that was that was an extrapolation of you know of her statement so basically he said that when she was at the station she was basically a you know a, a, a bunch of male officers accosted him and all it you know stripping all this kind of thing. But there was one slightly not not we're well, not like you know not fully but you know just slightly sympathetic white female police officer who was a bit more you know you know just and who basically at one point just told him yeah we can book you up and you know you should go to the you should go to the local hospital yeah, and he's up there. So I so I extrapolated that. That very, it's like it was almost like a one, a, a, a one line sentence about this female police officer she, that she interacted with and to go to the hospital. And I decided that, that would make a, a, a good a conversational element to kind of show again um, the intersectional differences at the time between them. Yeah, no, I'm glad you did. It's a really lovely little little scene. I mean, there was, um, now that you have screened the, the film in a, a couple of US 
festivals. Have you found there's been a different reaction? Are people quite curious about the British side of the story? Because you're, you're right, we don't get a lot of media about about that time over here. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely was. There was a, there was a, there was actually a lot of curiosity. It's like a lot of American, a lot of. Well, I mean, I guess the audience that I've, 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 I've received that with so far, they didn't, they didn't really realize that we were kind of dealing with similar sort of civil rights issues, you know. You know, while they were doing it in the sixties and seventies as well. So yeah, there was a, there's a, there's definitely a lot of. Um, it's almost, a, it's almost. It's almost quite shocking to them that that type of thing was happening in, in the UK. I mean, they they just they just a lot of a lot of uh, Americans just don't have that concept of you know the, um, the black struggle in the UK um, being very equivalent to mm -hmm. what was going on in, in, in America. So yeah, yeah. Going back to kind of some of the things that have influenced you. I mean, when when I asked you to kind of, you know, before we we spoke, mm -hmm. had a, I asked you to send over some films that have either influenced Ballad of Olive Morris or you as a filmmaker. And when you when you mentioned Malcolm X, you yeah. said it was one of the best biopics, in your opinion, one of the best biopics ever made. So I want to ask you, what makes a good biopic? What makes a good film about someone's life? Because because we're not talking documentaries, we're talking about you know drama. So we so there's. Um, yeah. uh, Rate of license met like taken, but but in your opinion, what is it that brings a, a true story to life, and why why is that film so effective in in your eyes? Um, it's just it really it's it really sort of gives you a very true insight into the person or the man in this case. Um, I guess before before um before the scene of the film, Malcolm X was kind of like a very sort of um he was. He was a political figure. He was, but he was not a he was not a fully three dimensional, you know, three dimensional person to me, you know. And in 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 how Spitely presents it, um, and again the performance of Denzel Washington makes a huge difference to that as well. Um, but you really you kind of see the evolution of a of a, a human being, his life in kind of almost four acts. Um, starts out as a um, as a as a hustler, as a pimp, as a, as a criminal. Um, becomes a prisoner, comes out, becomes um, a sort of very, very virulently um, militant um, segregationist, as you, you can call it that. It's true. It's just, it's, 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 it's like, yeah, black people one side, white people one side. And then he kind of goes to Mecca and then he becomes, he just kind of like almost changes again, you know? And to see, see that, see that evolution, that very organic human evolution, of a life um, in a film, I've really seen that done, and as well, and that's why I rate that film so much. It's like again, you see that you see you see through steps, essentially, he's four different people in that film, and that's how life works. You don't stay the same; you keep changing. But to see it done that way in film is very impressive. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Yeah, it was. I'd never seen it before, so thank you for for <laughs> for giving me an excuse to go and watch it because um, it, it's it's a long film. Never seen it before. Wow, wow. I well, I hope you got. Uh, yeah. What What did you? What? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean to fair, fair. I mean to be fair, not everyone's seen everything, but um, it's definitely something that I, I, I you know, I, I think people it should be on people's like general watch this, especially if they're gonna, especially if you're ever gonna attempt to 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 tell a story about a real person, and that's a that's a must watch. Yeah, no, I, th I think let's put it on the on the A level film studies curriculum. Get more people watching it instead of uh, instead of some of these. Oh my god, there's been so many bad biopics. <laughs> like, I think we need to go back. Let's go back to what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tell me. <laughs> yeah, um, tell me. About it. And yeah, I mean, uh, kind of going back to to how you started as a as a filmmaker. Um, I mean, did where where did this start for you? Did did was this something that you always wanted to do, or did did it kind of evolve? Did you go to film school? Kind of how did how did this interest kind of begin in you? Yeah, so yeah, it's it's always been it's always been um, uh, a thing. The thing is, I didn't really come from um, what you call a, 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 a artistic family or creative background. So it was kind of it was kind of like it was almost kind of like. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't feel 
it didn't feel kind of like um, an almost achievable thing for for the well, well, not for, not for me. I I, I believe it was, it was doable, but I think for people around people, you know, around me, friends, family, just kind of well, you know, just go and do a regular career. I mean, like I was expected to do something like, like more, like more or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. So again, because I wasn't really super encouraged to head in that direction, that was kind of discouraging to an extent. But I did eventually end up going to um, to film school. Uh, well, a film film u- university from uh, I did university film school uh, by London Metropolitan mm-hmm. University, and, um, and then I finished that. I went out. You know, I also I also did training as an actor um, for a couple of years, and you know, I basically started putting it together. Uh, you know, you know, I made plenty of shorts in in, in Union after, and some of them you'll never see. They just stay on my hard drive because I didn't. <laughs> We've all got a so, hidden box uh, somewhere. At the end of the day, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, I got a hidden box of bad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Well, I mean, you know that that's the thing. You, 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 know, you gotta, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta make it, you know, you, your, your trash to grow. And <laughs> and yeah, so I just like I kind of you know I I, I I've been making stuff over the years. You know, some are sh- some are put out there, some are won't. But again, um, I became um like, I guess uh, what I, I did a project for um Olive Morris, which is very very different. It's called the Solution. Um, it's like a it was like a detective comedy thing. Okay. It was a TV pilot. When I got um that was 2019. I got nominated uh for the Test Card Pilot, award, which is like the best pilot award at the Edinburgh TV. Festival, um, for the new voices award, and that kind of that was really, I guess, what you call my industry breakthrough. Um, so that, so after that, I started getting industry recognition. Um, it played at TV festivals basically everywhere, went to South Korea, went to, went to Spain, went to uh, Brazil, um, um, and America as well. So that, 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 that previous, I guess, short by, by. I marketed it as a TV pilot. It it, it did the round on the TV as well. So that in turn um, kind of, again, it, you know, it kind of was my industry great food and it allowed me to kind of reach out to people, you know, a high, a higher caliber of, caliber of, of, um, collaborator, you know, um, actors and so forth, make all of more. So that's, that's, you know, is, these are all steps to, to, to keep going and get to the next level. Yeah, I mean, your crew always makes such a massive difference to these things, and the, the you know the ta- you can see the talent that you had on Ballad of Olive Morris on screen. You can you know you, because it's a period piece as well. I think it's extra clear when you can see like the style of the cinematography, you know, the production design, the the acting, all of that kind of goes into creating a, a time period. So you can really see the you know the people that you had were yeah. really high standards. So I mean. Um, Going, kind of going going back to that so like that authenticity was that something that you talked about with with your crew and and you know was were really keen to to get across how did you work together as a as a group and just at the end of this if you could kind of go through how you worked as a as a director and a producer yeah like i mean to be i mean to be honest like authenticity was always you know there was even before the crew was assembled that was always my something that always had to be you know key um, so I, 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 the story of the project was like, like fully storyboarded and, and a lot of research was done. But obviously when I got, um, when I got together, uh, my cinema, cinematographer, um, Zeb Shaka, Gina, and, uh, uh, my production designer, Chewie Antoinette Green, and, um, hair and makeup and costume departments, um, every, they all kind of had to be in sync. So. I kind of, you know, I gave, I had, I had one to ones with all of them. And then I started saying, I started, you know, getting uh, them together and saying, these are my, these are, these are what, these are the things I want. These are the things I need to talk to me, but also talk to each other. So I, I kind of made it, sometimes the departments kind of like, they don't really, um, not all HODs are in direct communication with each other, but I kind of made a stipulation where you, where they all had to be talking to each other. Yeah, to be it, it, everything had to be in sync, and I think that's kind of what I think that's why I think why it worked out as well as it did. Um, yeah. 
because uh, there was no, you know, like there was no, there was no separation of, of intent. You know, everyone, everyone was pretty much on the same page because it was all, because it was all digital. I made sure yeah. that was there. You're working at the best. That's kind of that though. Yeah. 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 And they say there's no, um, there's no iron team. <laughs> yeah. That's the one. Yeah. That's the same. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so just to kind of finish off this this chat with you, um, you also sent me a couple of other films that had influenced you as a filmmaker. Had Godfather Part One and Two, and we also had yes, really interesting film that I had not heard of um, called uh, is it I can't, can't pronounce it Gattaca Gat- Gattaca is that correct? Called oh, Gattaca Gattaca yeah. yeah. I'm I'm a huge sci-fi nerd, so this kind of hit all my <laughs> all my buttons. Um, are, yeah. are you into your sci-fi? Is that this where this kind of interest comes from? Because it's a re- it's a really interesting film. It is, isn't it? It is. Isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm fully into I'm fully into sci-fi. I used to read, you know, I used to read all you know all types of sci-fi, you know, and that type of stuff when I was growing up. So yeah, I, that's 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 my jam. It's not it's not it's not it's not fully apparent in what I've made yet, but I probably intend to at some. point. I was that was going to be the next thing I was going to ask. I was yeah. like, is the sci-fi on the horizon for you at some point in the future? But um, but guess what? One hundred one. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, I, you know, you know, I'm gonna be eclectic. It's not all gonna be, you know, it's not all gonna be, you know, civil rights stuff or whatever. It's gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. I mean, like I said, like the thing I did before there was a comedy. So you yeah, know, like people aren't necessarily. Always know what to expect from me. So I like that's what I like. That's what I like to hear. You never know what's coming next. Yeah, yeah. But one hundred percent. Um, I really, I thought that I thought that film Gattaca when I first saw it, I was kind of blown away by it. Um, I know a lot of people like swear by like Stanley Kubrick. I think that's it's got it's got Kubrickian kind of like um, a statement. Yeah. It's it's very it's very it's very clever. It's very smart. It's uh, it's directed and written by a New Zealand uh, New Zealand filmmaker called Andrew Nichol, and he made a few he made a few other films. Like he did a film called Lord of War with Nicolas Cage and Simone with Al Pacino. Uh, and yeah. actually, I think Truman Show didn't he? He wrote, he wrote the Truman Show. Yeah, yeah, that's what he wrote. He wrote it. I don't I don't believe Peter Weir directed it, but he wrote. I think, it. Right. Yeah, yeah, and he was involved <laughs> in, in some capacity. Can't believe that that's coming off the top of my head. But yeah, uh, oh yes, yes, yeah. So yeah, he just yeah, he. I I just thought, you know, you know, I I, I think I'm not sure if that was his debut film, but if, if it was, it's a, it's incredible, it's, it's incredible film. And I was just very intrigued by a um, it's a very human story. Um, with the, again, what it uses um, sci- uh, I guess sci-fi, like science fiction sort of uh, tropes. To discuss like human ethics and morality, and you know the way things. It's, it's, I mean, it's very, very, it's very, very plausible. What happened? What? 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 Oh no! It, I mean, I was, I was just going to say, it's, it's such a like, it's such a creepily probable film. <laughs> That's what kind of makes it so effective. Because I mean, there have been these to kind of just, just to kind of let let the listeners know what it's about. So it's, it's essentially, it's, it's in a near future where. Um, your life is essentially predetermined from birth. They take a sample of your DNA and they know like the exact date of your death and every biological disadvantage that you're likely to have. And it's essentially led to kind of the birth of a new class system where genetically kind of superior, I'm doing air quotes, you can't see the podcast, but genetically superior um, humans essentially are, are at the top of the class and, and kind of anybody who has, you know, any, any, defects again in it in bunny bunny years is at the bottom of the, the pile and you know these babies are kind of being genetically engineered to have the most favorable qualities to kind of give them a, a leg up in life and it's i mean for something made in the 90s it's so kind of chillingly relevant to some of the discussions that have been going on recently about like you know design the babies but but also this kind of you know that there is a, a really clear kind of soci- sociology subtext about you know the people in our current class system 
you know, being given a worse start in life because of who they were born as. So it's a re- it's working on multiple levels. It's a really, really interesting film. And um, some great acting in it as yeah. well. Ethan Hawke and Jude yeah. both both fantastic in this film. Yeah, they're really yeah, they're both brilliant. Um Ethan Thurman speaking in it as well. And um there's yeah, there's a yeah, it's just it's just like I actually think, you know, I don't I don't toss the road around like that that often. I think people think I think to be film critics, they'll do it. I think, you know, we go to things a masterpiece. But I think, you know, I think that's up there. I think it's really, you know, it's really under super underrated and very, you know, and very prescient, prescient and still relevant. You know, I think it was made like nine seven or something like that. Yeah. And like it, it holds up. I I've, I've I've watched I watched it not long not that long ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, you know, I love everything about it. Like the, the production design, the score, um uh with Michael Nyman, it's beautiful. Beautiful uh, music, and again, I, I like. I also like um, in in in, in amongst all that, it kind of shows the triumph of like human spirit and will, because you have yeah. Ethan Hawke's character who's kind of like, it's like he's been told that he's destined to fail for life because just a, just a, as genetic probability is just giving him a hard defect. It's like, mm-hmm. you no, know, he he's he's told what he can't do, and he and he literally says to himself, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to fight, um, like any sort of predestined fate. I'm not going to, I'm going to fight against it and you not, know, and, and, and make, make my, my, my dream happen or my life happen. I think it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful sentiment, the way, the way it plays out. And I, I, I'm not going to give away spoilers because it's probably a film, but, no, yeah, um, spoilers here. I think the, the, yeah, yeah, but um, I, I, I love, I love the bit at the end where he's, he's swimming against the tide, and yes, gets to the end, and then, and then, and um, his brother, I guess, asks him how have you done it, and he says, "I never saved anything for the swim back." Yeah, that's like holy shit. That's like that was such a yeah. That's like he, he just gave it everything. He didn't. No, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. He made a choice not to save anything to get back. He had to get all the way to the other side to survive. Mm-hmm. And again, that's um, again, that's a that's within the whole sci-fi and that it's it's a very human story. Now. That's that's what we appeal to. And to tell, to tell some the story of that nature, something similar, something of that ilk appeals to me. So I would be fan of that. Yeah, I mean, um, with, with like the your, the, th- the films that you brought up, they all have a bit of quite an an epic quality to them, but kind of a human story underneath it. I mean, that that's kind of the, the theme that I'd see for all of them, especially you know talking about the Godfather. That is, you can't get more epic than the Godfather one and two. But at the centre of it, it's it's a family drama. You know, it's it's a uh, it, it's about human interaction. It's about how they, you know, the conflict that appears between two people and how it grows and changes so is that something that that you w- would you agree that that's something you've always been interested in kind of these these vast films human stories yes i would say i would say i would say consciously and unconsciously yeah yeah that that's kind of like what, what i'm drawn to a lot um big canvas but very intimate human interaction i mean to an extent with all of moist you could say that it's like it's for sure, it's pretty ambitious. Um, in sort of like you know period, you know like you go a lot of time get vehicles and you know cross you and all this stuff. It's not like you know it's not like you know it's not like in one room and you know, mm-hmm. talking heads. You know. So yeah, I guess you know I guess yeah I guess I kind of do I do I I like to work on um, on that type of canvas. You know that scale. I mean I, I it's that. It, a lot of filmmakers, I, I guess, I admire. Like, you know, it's, I mean, mm. I, I've talked about you know, like, I would you know, help them and what Sparky did. In the and that was a great uh, big canvas things, but you know, like Ridley Scott, I, um, I like a lot of what he does. And again, he creates worlds. Mm. You know, he's very, very strong in production design and sort of well cinematography as well. But it's, but it's, it's, it's 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 well building, it's mise en scene. So that type of thing is it interests me a lot. You know? 
yang begitu kali Mabah dan Sir in the I mean, well, it's been it's been wonderful to talk with you, Alex. Thanks again for taking the time to to do this. Just before we go, um, can you tell us anything about what you've coming up next? What what are your plans? You know, kind of going forward. Oh, what I've got coming up next. Um, well, I hope to. I mean, in terms of like physically, um, I do hope to. I'm going to be going to Ireland, um, uh, fairly soon. As I'm, um, I'm judging the competition. Uh, Wine Valley International. Uh, so it's a script question. So I'm going to be part of it. Um, that soon. And hopefully I'll be going to the Masters Junior um, from Africa as well. I mean, I know they're bombers with it last year, so it's good enough. I mean, you know, if there's a chance that you could see the event. This is certainly good enough for me. <laughs> so I might be up. <laughs> well, it's wild, isn't it? That's like, you know, that's a very end note. I. I looked it up. It's very, very, very well attended. That's by the, the yeah. The, it was the Jakers Hollywood in yes, local establishment. So that'd be that that would be that'll be fun. Well, work wise, I'm I'm working on on uh, projects. Um, uh, I'm not really at liberty to say too much about it, but it's, uh, it's a guest feature, and um, I'm you know I'm just putting together treatments and we know script. And it's more case of that, but yeah, um, I guess uh, that's really why I'm not working on that. I'm, I'm also, I'm also, I'm a producer and uh, also the production of other people's shows as well. So I, I stay busy. Yeah, you're a busy man. I was going to say you've got a lot, a lot of plates spinning there. Um, so thank you for taking some time time out to talk with us. It's been it's been lovely and good luck with everything going forward. I'll be kind of following you on Instagram. Where, where is the best place for people to find you if they want to kind of follow your work and and look at what you're doing? Oh uh, yeah, well Instagram, it, yeah Instagram's like you know pretty good. Um, uh, that <laughs> that's uh you can get me on Instagram Alex Kaye K so A L E X K A Y L B E K A Y my Instagram or you can find me on Twitter or Twitter call it, okay. uh, at Alex <laughs> K underscore K so that's at A-L-E-X K underscore K-A-Y so you can follow me on Twitter and uh, Instagram so. brilliant yeah alright and that's that's everything for this episode so thank you everybody for listening and we'll be back with our usual film reviews next week Thank you.